recorded at Get a Grip Studios in Toronto, Canada, a Get a Grip management production and in association with the Get a Grip on Lighting podcast. Financially supported by the National Association of Innovative Lighting Distributors and presented by the National Lighting Bureau, the Illuminating Engineering Society, and the International Dark Sky Association. Added to the IES's 2021 Progress Report, this is Starving for Darkness, a podcast. Hang on a second here, folks. That's right, hang on a second. Michael Colligan, co-host of Starving for Darkness here. Just to tell you real quick before we get into the conversation, which is super important for you to hear, that you need to go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com, especially if you're a contractor or a distributor, Greg Eric. That's right. And they're coming out with a new exterior line of product, or they have come out with it, and they're going to continue to add to it, and they're dedicated to making dark sky friendly lighting. Uh, and potentially dark sky compliant as we go. For now, though, they do have a dark sky full cutoff wall pack, a variety of wattages, Kelvin temperatures, and a precision crafted optical lens that's ideal for increased fixture spacing and uniformity. So less lighting fixtures needed because it, it can provide more light out of the one fixture. So check that out. Go to keystonetech.com. That's right. Hold on. Here comes Starving for Darkness. But before, K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. Hello, listeners and darkness lovers. Welcome to another episode of Starving for Darkness. My name is Jane Slade, and I am thrilled to have our next guest, Kelly Beatty. Kelly Beatty has been explaining the science and wonder of astronomy to the public since 1974, an award-winning writer and communicator, he specializes in planetary science and space exploration as a senior editor for Sky and Telescope magazine. Kelly has been active in efforts to reduce light pollution for more than 30 years. He served for more than a decade on the board of directors for the International Dark Sky Association and is now an officer with IDA's Massachusetts chapter. Kelly, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Uh, oh, it's my pleasure, Jane. Great to be here. So we start every episode with the same request. So could you please tell us about a dark sky experience that left you with a feeling of awe? Absolutely. You might think it came from my childhood, uh, and I had plenty of those, but the one that really sticks in my mind was uh, I was leading a tour in Africa, in South Africa in 2003, uh, to see an eclipse of the sun. And we were staying at a camp way out in the middle of nowhere. And after dinner, we were going to go outside to do some stargazing. And I, I stepped outside a little bit ahead of time. It was a beautifully clear night. And I was just left open mouthed with not only the beauty of the southern sky, that was the first time I had seen it, but the, the two Magellanic clouds, the satellite galaxies that accompanied the Milky Way through space were just hanging overhead like, uh, you know, softly glowing cotton balls in the night. And it's a sight I'll never forget. I'm so glad that I got to open with your description because I think, you know, when people say your name and your work, the fact that you're a science communicator, it's it's just so part of what you do and the way that you use descriptive language to bring that to a person that's less familiar with the night sky. Um, it's just beautiful to hear and read. And um, I, I definitely want to get into to your work as a communicator because I think that's such an important piece to getting the dark sky message out. And so you are the communications officer for IDA Massachusetts. Can, and that's actually how I first became familiar with you. Um, can you talk about your role there and um, what you what your role consists of? Sure. Our chapter is uh, relatively new. It's been around for about three years, and we're very active. We have a core group of about uh, six or eight people who are tapping into all kinds of things simultaneously. Just yesterday, for example, we had a public hearing on Beacon Hill, which is where our state house is, for a bill that I helped write. Uh, that we hope will be a model for statewide bills to uh, regulate outdoor lighting nationwide. And we had a series of five people uh, make presentations. We get three minutes each. We wait for hours for our turn, and then we get three minutes each. 
and and to make our case of course we can submit written testimony too and this is a bill that we've tried to pass for a number of times and so my job is to sort of in that sense coordinate the interface with the with the committee that we dealt with uh, that's sort of at the high end of what I do. The low end of what I do, well, it's not low. It's all important work is to make sure that our, our modest website is maintained and that notices are, are put out. And also to occasionally uh, stay in contact with all the members of IDA who are in Massachusetts because we consider them all our members. There's no cost to be a member of our chapter separate from IDA itself. So it, it keeps me busy. And uh, and in fact, it's I, I have formally retired from full-time work at Sky and Telescope, and this is the biggest chunk of what I still do, is dark sky work. Well, uh, I'm so happy to have you uh, fighting in the movement to bring this message, especially with the way that you are able to communicate about darkness and its importance. Now, I know about that, Bill, and I'll just also say that I am uh, here with you from Cambridge, Massachusetts. So um, I'm very happy for the work that you're doing for this region as well. And I know that that bill has sort of been in the works for a while. Um, has it changed from where it is now to where it was uh, a bit ago? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there was a time, so it's changed in two fundamental ways. When we first started to get this bill passed, it had a very simple concept. If you're using state money to install outdoor lighting, then that lighting needs to be fully shielded. That is, point all the way down, nothing above horizontal. That was basically it. And believe it or not, we got a lot of pushback from the lighting industry. Now we're talking like 15 years or so ago uh, from lighting stakeholders uh, because they, they imagined they were threatened by this somehow and imagined that towns were going to be forced because full cutoff lighting leaves us a sort of more confined area of light underneath them that everyone was going to have to rip out all their street lights and install new ones that were closer together, which wasn't the case. We never asked for that. Mm. So what has happened in the, in, in the meantime is that we have uh, IDA in general and us in particular uh, have, have had a rapprochement with, with the lighting folks and we've engaged them in writing the bill. And so, for example, the International Association of Lighting Designers fully supports our bill. We have connected with the Illuminating Engineering Society, which is the standards setting organization for the United States for lighting of all kinds. And they're on, you know, they're on board, if not fully supportive. So that's one thing that has really changed. We have no, the, the, those groups that were uh, vocally and obtrusively opposed to this bill in the past are no longer. The other thing is that we have, over the time, we have made it a better bill, a more um, multi-tiered bill. So, for example, we still want that full shielding on lights, but we also want those lights to have a color temperature of 3,000 kelvins or less. Now, for those of you who are not familiar with this lingo, um, lighting people use temperature as a proxy for the color of the light. The higher that temperature, the bluer the light or the more blue in that light. So we want to push the temperature down to reduce the blue light as much as possible. And I'm sure we'll get into this. Blue light at night is just a boogeyman in all kinds of ways uh, from the standpoint of creating sky glow and, and blotting out stars, interrupting uh, circadian cycles for insects and, and nocturnal animals. And for humans, it, it, it affects us as well. And we've also, for the first time this time around, um, put in a modest restriction on how much light to use. That had never been there before. Mm. So now these, this, these IES standards, as it stands right now, only provide minimum levels of light and don't really say how much you can light. So, so we find a lot of situations, and, and you've probably seen them as well, where things are horribly overlit, far brighter than they need to be. And so... We now have a sort of threshold that uh, dictates, according to these standards, you know, you can't exceed that minimum level by more than 50% unless you have a good reason for security. And this seems to have been very well received. Um, and the, one other aspect of this bill that we've, we've included that is very attractive to local towns and cities is this. Modern LED streetlights, especially, especially in residential areas, use very little power. 15 watts, True. 13 watts, something like that. But the state has a set of uh, benchmarks or what are called tariffs 
that uh, they they send out to the utility companies and say, here are the here are the thresholds at which you can charge people for the electricity for their streetlights because there are no meters on streetlights, and the lowest level is 25 watts as it stands right now. So as a town, I might have thousands of streetlights that are only using 13 watts, but I'm getting charged for 25 watts of electricity for each one of those. So mm -hmm. if our bill passes there will have to be a new lower wattage tariff and that will actually immediately start saving towns money and that's very appealing to municipal governments that we've talked to well that sounds like a much more honest approach to the energy argument as well because then people can actually save and reduce light and reduce energy all at the same time i just i know that so much of how we landed here is through energy efficiency um, which is weird, but essentially it was it became a scramble to get more lumens per watt, more light per energy unit, so that that appeared better on paper, but then we were splashing light everywhere unnecessarily. And so it looked energy efficient while we were only getting brighter. So I love that you're kind of trying to tie it back to actually achieve energy savings, money savings, and less light in a more honest approach. That's that's wonderful. Um, and I did want to get into this uh, because it sounds like I love to use the word rapprochement um, because this was a my, my hard hitting question for you, which is that, you know, traditionally I've, I've often said, but the IDA knows darkness and the IES knows lighting. And there hasn't always been um, a lot of agreement been the, between the two groups, even though I think in their hearts they they want the same things. So it's been kind of interesting to see, um, you know, not a perfect working symbiotic relationship between the organizations over the two over the years. So um, I just wanted to get your, um, you know, your take on that relationship as it has evolved over the years and where we are, what we can do better, what has been, been doing better so far? That's, that's a great question. And, and actually to answer it, we need to go way back to the origins of the IDA, which was formed in 1988 by uh, a professional astronomer, Dr. David Crawford and uh, Dr. Tim Hunter, who's, who's an amateur astronomer. And at that time, in those years, those early years, uh, it was focused in and around the Tucson area where there's a lot of astronomical telescopes. And it was an astronomical problem. You know, when the, the, the idea was, let's keep the skies dark so that astronomers can see what they're doing. And, and it always, in those days, was kind of a niche uh, argument. But Dave Crawford was very smart, and he started engaging the lighting community right away. And at first, that 30 years ago, no one had heard of light pollution, and he was like a voice in the wilderness. But gradually, over time, he has, he has made these lighting stakeholders realize that there is a lot to this. And it's not just about astronomy. It's about the environment. It is about saving energy. It's about quality of the ambiance of the nighttime environment. Uh, we have shades on our lamps in our homes like the one behind me here uh, for Good a reason point. because looking at the bear <laughs> looking at the bare bulb is is you know annoying so we yeah. put shades on them to diffuse the light onto the target area which is the rest of the room same with outdoor lighting one of the first things that came to be realized by the lighting stakeholders was that glare that is seeing these bare bulbs uh which is a, one of the, uh, the consequences of not having fully shielded lighting uh, was annoying to people and it was dangerous in some situations when you jane someday when you get to be as old as i am <laughs> you'll have more difficulty seeing at night and it's because right. the, the lenses in our eyes gradually become more cloudy and it turns out that the scattering in our eye is much more pronounced at blue wavelengths for the very same reason that the sky is blue and i won't get into why that is but it's the same physical process blue light is scattered much more readily it creates much more sky glow at night and so if you can reduce the blue light especially then you make it easier to see and the the lighting community at first was just ballistic over this notion that that we were uh, uh, championing for low blue light fixtures. And gradually that's become more and more the best practice. 
And so yes. you'll find all kinds of uh, major, uh, you know, energy companies and, and state departments of transportation who are now installing uh, street lighting that is this lower color temperature, this 3000 Kelvin, just because it, people prefer it. And so mm -hmm. about April of last year, April of 2020, the IDA and the IES, this Illuminating Engineering Society, created a kind of partnership, a pact, for what are called the five principles of good outdoor lighting. And it's the same five things that the IDA has been championing all along. Only use light uh, when you need it, where you need it, and only as much as you need, and have it be a low color temperature, and have it be controllable if possible. And so, you know, that controllable part is a fairly recent development because the lights that are being replaced now by the tens of millions across our country and around the world even uh, are, are holdovers from technology that was actually developed during the 1950s and 60s. Um, and, and the most common kind is a kind of peachy colored light called high pressure sodium. Mm -hmm. And high pressure sodium lights do not like to be controlled. They want to come on at dusk. They want to stay on all night and they want to be turned off at, at, at daybreak. They don't like being turned on and off. They cannot be dimmed. And so it was kind of a technological dead end in a way. LEDs, light emitting diodes by contrast, are infinitely controllable. You can, you can change their color. You can make them dimmer. You can turn them on and off many times per second and they don't care. And so this has opened up a, a radical new way to control and shape the way we light at night. And, and the lighting people finally have technology that allows them to do the kinds of things that the IDA has been espousing for decades. And so I think what we're seeing now is a lot more closeness. We, we both here in Massachusetts and nationally and internationally, the IDA, uh, it, we're in fairly constant contact with, with the lighting stakeholders. Uh, we go to the IES's meetings and to the roadway lighting meetings, and they come to our meetings, and we have speakers in each other's camps. So I think there is a there is a you know a, a partnership and a growing trust between each other, and I think a lot of that is is actually rooted back in Dave Crawford, who turns out to, was right all along, <laughs> and it's taken decades for the lighting people to embrace that. Yeah, I don't I don't uh, fault your critique of the lighting industry because i i would also coming from the art lighting industry argue that we are not going fast enough um and that more needs to be done and sometimes i really scratch my head at the lack of uh movement in the right direction from my own industry so i don't fault you there um i do remember sitting in on a IDA chapter meeting with you and being like, are they going to hate me because I'm in the lighting industry? Um, but you are all very, very kind. And I think that there is more work to be done to build that trust, as you're saying, and that it's it's beginning. Um, and it's really nice to see and hear um, the arc of where we started from and where we, we, are, we are now, because it's vastly improved. Um, I, I love what you're saying about controllability because I actually argue in my work that controls supersede dark sky compliant lighting as a tool because there's nothing better than off and we are leaving lights on unnecessarily through the night. And, you know, for whatever reason, dark sky lighting is not used ubiquitously even now when people have the choice. And so I feel like it solves that problem too. Not that I'm advocating not using non-dark sky lighting, but it, it certainly is a bigger tool. And, and I have these words written down, um, which I'm writing about, but the words are the future of lighting is a symphony. Because if we add in controls, and if you think about the way that we're lighting, it's, it's a French horn playing through the night at one note, one decibel, over and over. We're not taking any craft to when we turn lights on, when we turn them off, how we dim them. What We can also change color uh, in the middle of an installation too. So this could be, you know, every instrument of color and light that we could use in this symphony that we're simply not. And Controls gives us that access to adaptive lighting, 
which could be so beautiful and wonderful. And it could really bring such a craft to um, how we implement lighting. So for me, I think controls are going to be a, a really, really important part. And I really believe that no lighting installation outside should be uh, installed without controls. I think that it's irresponsible uh, not to. I, you're absolutely right, Jane. And let me reach over here and get a prop. Um, you, you know, we, we need to sort of think of outdoor lighting in two broad categories. One is street lighting and the other is what we call area lighting, parking lots and sides of buildings and walkways and stuff like that. The street lights, I think, are embracing the notion of controls a lot more quickly. Uh, and, and for those who have a street light anywhere nearby them, that you want to go outside and look for one of these, which is on mm -hmm. top of your street light. It's like a, a roughly the size of a hockey puck. And there's a little sensor in there. You can see it and see the window for it, which points north, by the way, so the sun doesn't shine in it. And this is a holdover from this uh, ancient technology uh, from the 50s and 60s, where the lights are, are told to turn on when it gets dark and stay on all night and, and turn off at dawn. What LEDs, LEDs can certainly still use these, but you, they can easily be replaced by one of two kinds of sensors instead of this like all or nothing thing. One is a sensor that uh, just has passive electronics in it that will automatically turn down the LED or turn it off uh, halfway through the night. So from like 1 a.m. till dawn when there's very little traffic and, and people are not walking around all that much and there's really not as much need. Um, the other kind of sensor that can be applied is, is uh, a networked sensor so that each, it's like a little uh, Wi-Fi receiver on each streetlight with, with its own individual ID or IP address. And so in Cambridge, for example, I right. you know, I think that the entire city's streetlight system is controlled by computer. And so yep. if Mrs. Smith down on the end of Elm Street uh, thinks that her light is too bright, then somebody in the Department of Public Works can call up that particular light and have it turned down, you know, to her liking, consistent with being safe and such. And this, this is really important for a couple of different ways. First of all, there is the control, but also the computer knows exactly how much electricity the entire system has used. And so in terms of paying the utility, you're only going to have to pay for what you've actually used as opposed to an estimate, which is the way it's mostly done now. Now, on the area lighting side, and not, Jane, I'm not sure what kind of design, your, your lighting design you do mostly, but in mostly area lighting, lighting, I think that is an area, yeah. what? Mostly is it area lighting? exterior street lighting, area lighting. So right in this domain. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think you'd agree that companies in lighting, commercial companies that in lighting their properties and, and parking lots have been less receptive or at least uh, slower to embrace, shall we say, uh, active controls because there is this fear of liability. Uh, mm. I, I have not run this to earth. So this is just my own anecdotal, what I've heard from people. I don't claim it's true, but you know, I've heard that some, some, especially like smaller companies, corporations are told by their insurance companies that they must light their property, including their parking lot all night, or they will be subject to lawsuits. I have seen situations where towns have removed a street light at uh, on a curve or something like that, and then an accident occurs there, and they are sued because there used to be a street light and now there isn't, as if the driver was counting on that street street light being there to you know to make the turn or whatever. So I think the the the, the challenge for us who are trying to fight the good fight uh, will be to some our, our next great threshold, I think, is engaging the insurance companies, uh, casualty and, and property insurance companies of, of the state, region, world, you know, whatever, um, to find out what they need and what, and, and are they caring over um, an old school thinking, you know, and it's absolutely true that people feel safer when there's more light around. Yeah, I think that's yeah. what's driving all this. But as you know, studies have shown that they are not actually safer with more lighting and that having less lighting or in some cases no lighting doesn't make you unsafe. I'll take a, a residential street, for example. My, my resident, I live in a little, uh, a beautiful little town called Chelmsford. I live in a residential area. We have no sidewalks I have. We just have the street. 
we have street lights on that street, but there, there's no there's no conflict zone. You know, there aren't people crossing. There are not crosswalks or anything like that. And so the speed limit's only 25 miles an hour. When I'm driving at night, no matter what the conditions, my headlights on my car easily give me enough visibility all by themselves to be able to stop for any reason at 25 miles an hour. It could be, you know, a kid playing kickball at four in the morning. Okay, fine. You know, I can deal with that. And so a, a lot of the, the rationale for having street lights in lots of different settings and area lights in lots of dis different settings is not borne out by the actual safety aspects. And I think that's the ne next great battle for us. I love that you brought up liability and I've written about it, that it is driving this this uh, fear of being sued. Um, it's driving over lighting. And I recently sat in on a uh, town meeting, which was evaluating a project in the Western Massachusetts region. And, you know, mostly my advocacy is very well received. But in this arena, it was not. And there was a lawyer on the call advocating for um, his client, the property owner. And it's everything you're saying that there is, uh, you know, there was no reasoning with him. There was no getting to the bottom. And I, I, I remember right, getting off that call and I have it on a post-it somewhere, which is that, you know, we need a, a, a an organization that's actually going to sue for overlighting to just bring it back in balance since there's suing happening from the direction of not enough light, which you and I know light is not preventing crime. It's not necessarily preventing accidents. There are times when it's helpful, but it's not a carte blanche solution. So I, I totally think there is work that needs to be done. And I love that we're uncovering that. Um, in terms of coordinating with the insurance companies and really getting to the bottom of the importance of darkness. Because I hope to see, you know, at least just in the counterbalance of it, that people start to sue for having their circadian rhythms being disrupted. disrupted. Right. Right. So the, I think there's something being lost in this easy, low-hanging fruit argument of safety and that it ends up driving the overlighting. So um Let's talk about blue light, since you seem to have a passion for its terrible impacts. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, and, and I also, I remember learning this on our, which is about a year ago, our IDA Massachusetts chapter call, um, all of the, the difference in the way colors of light scatter. And uh, right. correct me if I'm wrong, but photographs from space actually don't even capture the light pollution that's happening because blue light is not able to reach there. So can you talk about, right. so, yeah. All right, let's take, the, let's take the satellite slice for just a second. Yeah. The early satellites taking pictures of the earth were a, a defense department series that had what, what I would call panchromatic sensors. Uh, they, they, they were sensitive to everything from blue light to red light. And so we were getting a fairly accurate picture of how much light was streaming up into space. Now it turns out that the light that's pointing straight up, you would think is the worst, but it's not. In terms mm -hmm. of light pollution, it's light that's heading out just above horizontal because it's skimming through much more of the atmosphere, scattering all along the way and creating all those uh, environmental effects. Light that points straight up is very soon out of the atmosphere and out into space, and it's only bothering the aliens, you know? <laughs> so um, th then we made a change, a transition to a newer satellite series, and those sensors are kind of blind at the blue light end. They're not picking up that light. And so it might seem as though the light pollution on the ground isn't getting worse, but that's only because it's not seeing this like horrible part of the spectrum, the blue part. And so it's, it's actually up to, uh, to us uh, on the boots on the ground who are taking measurements of, of the amount of light pollution and, and, uh, and so forth to create a kind of ground truth for those scientists and researchers who are studying the satellites. There's a paper that just came out um, uh, that that addresses this blue light blindness in the satellites. And the, the estimation is that we're actually underestimating the amount of light pollution by uh, by up to 50%. Uh, 
That so so it's very important for those of us who are on the ground to continue to make measurements. And and Jane, I, I hope if you haven't yet, put on your list somebody to, to interview is uh, Connie Walker from the IDA, uh, who is the champion of, a, an org, of a, a project called Globe at Night. And everyone can look it up, globeatnight.org. Uh, it's a citizen science effort to gauge how dark your sky is. And you don't need any equipment and you don't need any experience. It was originally designed to be used with school children as a kind of classroom activity. But it turns out to be great for assessing for us, everyday people all around the world to assess how dark our sky is, is it getting worse? Um, so the, the blue light at night is, is uh, I've kind of alluded to this, it scatters more readily, uh, it creates more glare in the human eye, and, and most importantly, it disrupts the circadian cycles of both plants, animals, and humans. And, and here's how it works. Um, some of us are old enough to remember that we used to have on our porches in the summertime a yellow light called a bug light. Uh, because bugs were attracted to white light, a white incandescent bulb, which has some blue in it, but they seem not to be uh, attracted to a yellow light, which has no blue in it. And so the point is, bugs like blue light and will be attracted to it. And it disrupts their, it doesn't, they're little things, right? It doesn't take much to disrupt the nighttime activity of a, of a bug. And in particular, there's work being done here in the Boston area at Tufts University on the impact of, of artificial light at night of any kind, but especially blue light, on fireflies. You've probably heard, and maybe even had somebody on, on your podcast here, that there is a dramatic drop in the number of insects worldwide. It's called, you can look it up, it's called the insect apocalypse. Yeah. We've got, you know, a third as many uh, bug, uh, two th we've lost a third to a half of all the bugs that we had e uh, since the 1970s, so over in the last 50 years. You used to be able to drive along the street and have bugs uh, at night and have bugs splattering your windshield all the time. That just doesn't happen anymore. There aren't as many bugs. And this blue light is implicated in a lot of that, and artificial light at night in general. We have disturbed their environment. For humans, I'll just touch on this, and this is again a topic, a great topic for another show. About 15 years ago, uh, we discovered that there's a, another sensor in our eye that has nothing to do with vision. It's a trigger that's hardwired to the pineal gland in our brain, specifically sensitive to blue light. And, and that, that trigger says to our brain, when it gets dark, it's time to make melatonin. And mm -hmm. so the, the pineal gland secretes this melatonin, which is, has all kinds of, 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 of effects on our body, on our well-being. People have taken melatonin to help them sleep. Um, it's, it's been shown to be an effective uh, barrier to, to the growth of cancers in mice. And so we are, you know, this, this trigger is, is very important. It's triggered by blue light. So when you, and it's not just like street lights or stuff like that. If you're watching your, you know, if you're streaming videos at two in the morning or checking your texts, it's bad for you. Here in our household, if, if even if you don't do that, if you make a run to the fridge or the bathroom at 2 a.m. Yeah. and you're suddenly blasted with light, your melatonin production crashes and you've got to start all over and you probably will wake up cranky. So for all those reasons, all those reasons, that's why we have been driving down this, this idea of blue light at night. All light at night, of course, is, is, has its detriments, but blue light is the especial uh, worst case. Yeah, the insect thing, it's, it bothers me so much. And how I got into this work uh, was actually through my, my feeling bad about what we're doing to wildlife. And the, there's no human health without wildlife health. There's, there's no separating that out. And so a lot of times I try to advocate through incentivizing humans about what humans are missing. But um, a statistic that I had put together to illustrate how important insects are is that at any given time, there's 10 quintillion insects on the planet alive. And if you average that each one weighs about that of an ant, insects outweigh humans uh, 70 to 1. They're a yeah. biomass. And so that with insects, you have pollination, um, you have it as a major food source for bats. Um, 
And so there, I mean, and multiple different animals. I mean, it's so integral to how our ecosystem works that I find it frightening that we have reduced our insect population so drastically. And you're saying up to a third or 50% reduction. I just don't know how you could think that light at night wouldn't impact that when you, you take the expression moth to a flame. It's so obvious. And yes, we need the scientific literature to study it and support it. But I just want to jump ahead here and say that I don't think there's anything more impactful than light at night on this problem. Because if you're saying this has occurred from the 1970s, well, that's when we started to see a lot more light pop up. And it's probably right. only so it's directly correlating there in my uh, momentary science science. But I, I just that I find that really scary when you when you think about the importance of insects in the whole network of living things on the planet. So um, I that's fascinating to hear about blue light and, and your take on on what it is actually doing to our environment. So I, I actually like yeah. to just take a minute to, to tell you an anecdote of a success story here in Massachusetts. Great. Uh, yeah. The Massachusetts Department of Transportation was going to relight the intersection of an interstate and a, a major state highway in south of Boston in, in the Canton area. And that turns out to abut the Blue Hills Reservation, which is the largest area of conservation land in the greater Boston area. And it's environmentally sensitive. It's not like we have endangered species there, but it's environmentally sensitive. And it turns out that the Mass Department of Transportation had not done the correct due diligence in terms of an environmental assessment. Well, somebody from MassDOT, a mole, contacted me and I got in touch with the Friends of Blue Hill and we mounted a campaign against this lighting plan. And to its credit, Mass uh, Dot, the Department of Transportation, made changes to the lighting plan. They changed the, the, the color temperature of what they were planning to install from 4,000 K, we've mentioned this before, to 2,700 K. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they, they removed some of the giant towers that they were planning to install uh, so that the, the, the Blue Hills Reservation would be as dark as possible even given this relighting. So your notion of, you know, like a class action environmental lawsuit is not mm -hmm. too far-fetched. And especially when you start talking about pollinators and the critical role that they play in food production, like apple trees and, you know, whatever it might be, uh, I, I think there's a pathway there in, in some extreme situations. I agree. And MassDOT is a very thoughtful organization, and I'm happy to see of... Um, uh, I've written for their newsletter, um, and so I'm happy to see that there's been some, some success stories, and I'm, I hope to see more uh, attending to the importance of light in our natural environment. Um, so I think there's a lot of um, starting in that direction, and it's nice to hear of a project that was really successful. I've hiked the, that area, the Blue Hills area. It's very beautiful. Um, and you're right, it is a massive area of land that is protected right in the Boston area. So I'm happy to see that you made an actual difference. Um, now, I, I want to get into your work as an astronomer. And so um, since 1974, you have been a contributor, senior editor, and major influence at Sky and Telescope magazine. And I just want to say for our listeners that Sky and Telescope actually published the Bortle scale on uh, an amateur astronomer, John Bortle published the Bortle scale in 20 years ago. So 2001. Right. Um, and I recently reached out to you about that because I was actually trying to assess how do we measure darkness and what I came away and thank you so much for being uh, a resource to me as I was writing that article. Um, that article is entitled darkness as a beacon. And I was trying to assess, you know, how do we measure darkness as a starting point? And what you were able to help me realize, because it's hard to look for something that doesn't exist, is that lighting, the lighting industry doesn't really have any great measurement of darkness as a starting point. We measure light all the time and we can tell you there's not much light, but we're not starting our thinking from that place. So thank you for being a resource to me through that article writing. And Always also... A and also for being, uh, you know, part of allowing that darkness scale of the Bortle scale uh, come into to come to life by being born in your magazine. 
um, which is one of the few ways that we actually do measure darkness in the lighting industry. So um, can you talk about your, your role uh, and your work at Sky and Telescope throughout the years? Um, I'd love to hear your stories of your work. Sure. Um, you know, it's funny, I, as, as you mentioned at the, at the top, my, my scientific training and, and background is in planetary science and uh, space exploration, you know, fairly technical high-end stuff. Uh, and I've loved doing that. I, I, I wanted to be an astronomer when I was growing up. I went to Caltech, uh, majored in astronomy, and was in grave danger of flunking out unless I shifted gears. So my degree is actually in geology, but it, it carried with me. And, um, and so somewhere along the line, I'm trying to remember exactly when it was, I started being the staff uh, editor who covered the light pollution issue and covered the early days of, of the IDA. And we had Dave Crawford and Tim Hunter write some articles for Sky and Telescope. And I just became more and more drawn into this. And of course, uh, you know, my childhood experience <laughs> with darkness was like many people. I grew up in a rural part of Central California, and I would go out at night and bang, the Milky Way was just there. It was my constant companion. And now that's rarely the case. And so I've been an observer, an amateur observer of the night sky, you know, virtually my entire life. And I had noted myself the decline and in, in the inability uh, to see stars in, in inner city situations. I might add, as a, just a trick for those who might be listening, if you're stuck in a dark city, I mean, in a brightly lit city, sorry, and you want to find a puddle of darkness, you can usually do that if you go to a local soccer field or a, a you know, a, a place that's not lit, a soccer field, a, a baseball diamond, a, something like that, where you can get out on the grass, because light pollution goes as the inverse square law. And that means mm -hmm. that the closer the source is to you, the more uh, obtrusive it is. And if you can get away from just the ones that are nearby, you'll have a better shot at, at seeing what you're trying to see up there. So I gradually became more engaged with the IDA, but I was kind of keeping my journalistic distance. Then in 2006, Sky and Telescope tried to, uh, started a spin-off publication called Night Sky, and I was the editor. This was a, a, an astronomy magazine for everyone. It was intended to be picked up, you know, incidentally off of a newsstand and taken home, you know, to read with their family and, and go outside and do stuff. Uh, very low threshold for, for uh, success in this. And it was at that point that I felt I had finally um, the positioning, uh, both scientifically and journalistically, to really be an outspoken advocate for, for, for fighting light pollution. And that's what caught me on the path that ended up you know, on the board of directors and so forth. So it's been a gradual uh, engagement. And, and now in retirement, I, I, I have told many people I could do this lighting work full time and it would be very, very mm -hmm. satisfying. <laughs> yeah, it is uh, endless. I completely agree. I, in my work, um, I feel that everything has about five tangents and then everything else has beyond there is five more tangents. So the work of pursuing natural darkness on the planet is for anyone wanting to get involved because we need more people. It's beautiful. It's poetic. It's uh, a connection, a reconnection back to the dark sky. Um, it's good for our circadian rhythms. As you say, melatonin helps um, uh, fight tumors. Um, so there's just a lot of benefit all around and we actually need more voices. So I agree, it is a full-time job and more than. Um, and also in your work, you, oh, did you want to jump in? Well, I was going to say, you know, John Bortle, who invented the scale, had been a contributor to Sky Telescope. He's a retired firefighter, actually, mm -hmm. uh, who specializes in comets. And comets are little faint, fuzzy things that are very difficult to see if there's any light pollution at all. It's not like a mm -hmm. star. There are a lot of stars you can study even in the worst light pollution. A star, double stars and star clusters, that sort of thing, but not comets. And so he invented this based on his own observing experience, this dark sky scale. And if, and if you want to, those of you listening and watching, if you want to know more about it, go to the Sky and Telescope website, which is skyandtelescope.org, and just search on Bortle scale. And it will, the, his original article is posted there, and you can call it up. And, you know, the, I think the word amateur actually is derived from a a love of something 
Um, and so Absolutely. sometimes it's kind of used pejoratively, um, but I actually want to implore that everyone listening and everyone on the planet has a relationship to the night sky that can be further developed. So I, I think that citizen science is going to be a key step in how we, we move forward. And, and one of the things that you do in your work, which is sort of indirectly beneficial of the darkness movement, is that you are also an eclipse chaser. And so I, I was um, actually driving uh, recently in the warm weather and I had NPR on and there was this wonderful piece about the eclipse and there was a nice man talking about darkness and it was you. I was like, oh my gosh, <laughs> Kelly. Um, and so uh, can I, I wanted to dig in and, and say, um, you've seen a lot of astronomical events up front. Which ones stick out? What were some of the ones that really moved you? Okay. I, I, again, there is a seminal event. I have been chasing eclipses uh, basically to lead tours that Sky and Telescope has, has created. Uh, we, we do this you know, to engage people and bring them with us and make some money along the way. And it was in 2003, it was an, an eclipse of the sun that could only be visible from Antarctica. And I was not about to take a bunch of people to Antarctica. And the next best thing was to take a plane and fly it over Antarctica and literally to intercept the eclipse in midair. And this only works if the sun is near the horizon, because you can imagine if the sun were overhead when it were being eclipsed, there was no way you could look out a plane's window to see it. So we chartered this big plane and um, we we can only look out one side of the plane. So there were a limited number of people on the plane, but it was a 50. 15-hour flight from the southern tip of South America over Antarctica and back. And wow. what you can see from the air that you cannot see from the ground, you know in your mind that the moon's shadow is racing across the Earth's surface. Uh, it's only about 100 miles across at best. Wow. So it's, you have to be in the right place in the right time to see a total solar eclipse. And you know in your mind when you're standing on the ground waiting for the eclipse to happen that this shadow is racing toward you at supersonic speed. But from the air, you can see the shadow coming like this dark cloud malevolently you know, approaching you on the surface of the earth. And when it catches up to you, because it's going much faster than we were even in the plane, the moment it catches up to you, the total eclipse starts. And up in the sky, the moon has completely covered the sun. And... It was a multi-sensory experience that was just cannot be equaled. So you were in, I just got chills. So you were in the plane, in the air, yes. observing this total solar eclipse. Right. And so did it immediately right. turn to d darkness? Did it feel like nighttime? Oh, yeah. Oh, it's, it's, you know, people say, oh, well, you have to look through a plane window. Well, yes. That's about the only inconvenience. The upsides are many. One is you're at 40, uh, you know, 35 to 40,000 feet. You're above most of the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is much darker. When the moon covers the sun, uh, its corona, the atmosphere, uh, is, stands out much more prominently. It's kind of an electric white. You can see more of it because the contrast is better. You can see more stars and planets in the sky because the sky is generally darker. And, and it's, it is a, it is a fantastic way. I've now seen, I've now seen four total solar eclipses from a plane, <laughs> uh, three from a ship. That's another interesting way to do it. I've got one coming up this December off the coast of South America on a ship. The prospects, the weather prospects are not good, <laughs> but we're going anyway. Uh, and then of course on the ground. And the thing about total solar eclipses, I know most people saw their first one and maybe their only one in 2017 when there was mm -hmm. a total eclipse that, that uh, went across the United States. We had the front row seats coast to coast and the weather was really good that day. So most everybody got to see it. And we have this saying in the eclipse biz that <laughs> when you see a total solar eclipse for the first time, Jane, did you get a chance to see it? I'm just curious. I was driving and it was not, no. The answer is a wholehearted uh, no. I did. I did not get. Okay, it. so if and when you get to see your first one, which could be in 2024, because there's another eclipse crossing the U.S., 
often we say anecdotally, the first four words out of somebody's mouth is, are, when's the next one? <laughs> because it becomes <laughs> very habit forming. And, wow. uh, and there are people on this planet who have seen, uh, I'm thinking particularly of Jay Pasikoff, a professor of astronomy at Williams College, who is a solar astronomer, who has seen, you know, 50 solar eclipses. Uh, and he, wow. he goes to great pains not to miss any of them, uh, which is why he was on that flight with us in June. And so it was, it, there are these people who must see every solar eclipse. So what was the energy like there on the flight? And the reason I ask is because I think that darkness creates a shared vulnerability. And so would you say that the, the band of you that was experiencing this together felt a bond emerge from sharing that experience? Um, and, and what was it like when, it, when you flew right into the path of the eclipse? Right. Um, it, it is definitely an exhilarating moment in your life. And, and in terms of expressing that, people do it in different ways. Some people are just sitting there in stunned silence, maybe even crying. You know, it's, it's as close to a religious experience, a spiritual experience as, as you're likely to get. Other people are extremely happy and shouting. And, and, you know, we always have, we always have a champagne toast or some kind of toast on the plane immediately after the eclipse is over because people want to party. They're in a very good mood. And the, your point about bonding uh, mm -hmm. is absolutely true, especially in a case like that. We had this giant plane and there were only about 70 of us total. Uh, some of the people with us, by the way, was a, a polar survival team from the Chilean armed forces in case we had to land in, in, uh, wow. in, uh, on Antarctica in, in the case of a, a problem. But it was a sharing moment, too. Everybody wanted to make sure that everybody else on that plane got to see it. So even though people had paid like six, eight thousand dollars for a window to look out of, um, they were very eager to like make sure the flight attendants got a peek and the pilots got a peek, and and so um, it, so that it became a communal uh, uh, a group group experience as opposed to an individual one. Yeah, I and I I love that it was something i mean that's a lot of money to pay for a seat but that it's something that you want to share and that also you're you know we're always talking about the addictive nature of light and light addiction and how we're not not just that light pollution is covering up the sky but that we're addicted to our phones and these devices that are um perpetually giving us light driven information and giving us dopamine kicks and so on the other side of that, it's really, really nice to see that darkness potentially could be addictive, that people could actually want to have more of that experience. Yeah, you, you mentioned NPR and many years ago now, uh, back when NPR was doing little uh, uh, contributed pieces uh, on All Things Considered, I took a crew from Vermont Public Radio to Stellafane which is the oldest organized group star party uh, ever. It's been going on since the 1920s. It takes place in Springfield, Vermont. And I took a, uh, it, was, there, it was just audio. So I took a, an audio engineer with me in the darkness, the deep dark of Stellafane. Mm -hmm. uh, and we walked from telescope to telescope and listened to the gasps and the oohs and the ahs of people looking at things that they can't see in the city you know they go to this place because it is dark and i should mention here that the international dark sky association has a certification program program called the international dark sky places and we now have more than 100 of these worldwide where the residents in that location often they're in existing parks or something like that but that community uh uh certifies and agrees to maintain the darkness in that location uh and, and we 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 check up on them periodically to make sure that they're um that they're that they're still doing that the, the woman running that is named ashley wilson i think she'd be a great yes, guest for you she was just a guest we have we just had her on the show huh. yep there you go yep um, yeah, I, I am so pleased to know that this darkness, um, these dark places, our dark sky places are burgeoning. And I, I do think, and what a wonderful way to convey that to people, because people don't know what they're missing 
we're so focused on light driven information that it feels like a deprivation to even think about not having um, that as being the stimulation. And so with darkness, actually that's, there's so much stimulation there that we have forgotten about. So I think that's a wonderful way to capture that by actually just capturing the, the oohs and ahs um, and, and trying to convey that. So, yeah, I want to mention in passing that the National Park Service has been really on the forefront of this notion of, of preserving darkness that you're talking about. Uh, 20 years ago, they dispatched a team of amateur astronomers to, to, to calibrate how dark the skies were over various national parks. And the Park Service in general has been pushing to uh, return the nighttime environment in the parks to its pristine state because that is half of the experience, the night experience is half of the, you know, a complement to the daytime experience. And so you'll find now that many national parks not only have, have fixed all their lighting to be dark sky compliant, but they have extensive night sky programs. And so if you're out on the road uh, visiting a park, check in that. Yeah, that's, that's a great suggestion. So you mentioned that you are, you're retired, but that the work is endless. So, um, and that you're probably working on some really wonderful projects with Sky and Telescope, you sort of mentioned. So what's on the horizon for your work? What do you hope to see in the next five years for this movement? And, and yeah, what's coming up for you? So for the movement, um, you know, this, this bill that we're pushing in the Massachusetts legislature is important. Uh, there are a lot of people who don't like regulation. But in my experience in talking to lighting stakeholders, and, and you as well, I'm sure, uh, to town municipal officials, for example, they don't have lighting people on their staffs. And yet they go and invest hundreds of thousands of dollars to replace their street lights, and they really have no idea what they're doing. They're, they, they talk to the people in the next town or whatever it might be. And so what I have seen is that a lot of lighting decisions get made that are really poor ones, awful lights, over lighting, mm -hmm. wrong color temperature, no controls whatsoever, not because they intended to do that, but because they didn't know any better. And so I guess my goal for the next five years, for me and the others who are, who are in this game, is to try to make ourselves available as much as we can and, and try to find out ahead of time when an installation is going in on whatever scale, because as you know, it's a lot easier to put in the right lights to begin with than to yank them out, to have to yank them out and replace them. And that has happened in some cities. Uh, Phoenix and Seattle and Davis, California come to mind as cities that installed street lights, LED street lights, and because of citizen complaints, had to rip them out and put in new ones. That is not the optimum way to do this. Mm -hmm. So. If we can have enough ears to the rail uh, to let us know, those of us who are activists, to let us know when something is happening, then we, we can become an educational resource for these decision makers and ultimately get the right lights installed to begin with. That's my goal for the next five years. As for me personally, I want to work <laughs> less and enjoy my life and my garden more. Uh, my wife and I are... are, are dead set on getting back to traveling. We just got back from a fantastic week in Arizona. I'm sorry, not Arizona, Alaska. Same, oh, is it? wow. Very, very different states, let me tell you. Alaska was fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, we're, we're going out to California. We're going to go on this trip at the end of the year to hopefully set foot on Antarctica. We got a bucket list planned and, and we're checking them off little by little. That's amazing. And is the dark sky coming into the the your trips and and in what you see and yeah is that coming in absolutely for example solar eclipses only happen at new moon so by definition oh. there's no moon in the sky and when i take one of these tours someplace i always try to find an opportunity even if it's just with a green laser to point things out by eye to do some stargazing with people there because we tend to be in remote locations and like you, stuck in the middle of Cambridge, you know, once you get out under a dark sky, sometimes if you're not familiar with it, it's, it's a little bit uh, confusing and maybe a little scary. And I bring, you know, calmness and mythology and, you know, uh, uh, an appreciation to what people are seeing. And that's always an, uh, a very popular and important part of what I do. 
Yeah, and touching back also on what you said about um, getting more support for municipal decision makers. Long term, I actually have a hope that we will license lighting as a profession um, and require that larger public projects actually have a licensed professional making these decisions. I, it's, it's a much more nuanced topic than people really know. And so a lot of times we end up with the wrong people making decisions because they, they aren't aware of the complexity. So I agree, we really need to support our municipal decision makers more. Um, and I, I hope to see more connections in, in there. So I see um, two important, I see two important trends in that direction, Jane. One is that these townspeople know that they're out of their depth and they tend to hire some kind of consultant, lighting consultant. And the second point is that those lighting consultants, people like you, you know, you've, you've drunk the Kool-Aid, you, you know what good lighting is and, and you're willing to install it. And it, and it's easy to make the case. It doesn't cost any more to do the right thing. No. And it's often um, less, we can do more with less light, quite frankly. And uh, it doesn't have to be more fixtures, actually. Uh, you could have the same amount of fixtures to deliver less light more beautifully and artfully um, and functionally. So, Kelly, I could probably talk to you all day, and I'm sure I'll be in touch as questions arise. You are a wonderful resource to me. Thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an absolute pleasure. Um, so thank you. Uh, oh, you're very welcome. And I enjoyed the chance to chat with you. Uh, and, and I'm sure we're going to have many conversations in the future. Yes, yeah, sounds good. Psst. Psst. Hey, don't go anywhere yet because we have some instructions for you. It's Michael and Greg from Get a Grip on Lighting. Yeah, we do the ads for Starving for Darkness. You got to go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H dot com. Light made easy, Greg. You've been able to that off real well. Uh, there's mm -hmm. a new line of exterior fixtures from Keystone that they have available, and they're going to continue to expand on it, and they're doing things right. And one of those that they're doing right is in their wall packs. They're making them full cut off. That's going to eliminate undesirable sky glow and glare, and that's what we all want. It looks nice. It fits the profile of a lot of your old nasty fixtures and has multiple wattages and kelvins that can cover you there. Get rid of those old nasties. Go to keystonetech.com. That's K-E-Y-S-T-O-N-E-T-E-C-H.com. Thanks for listening to Starving for Darkness.